Welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. I'm delighted to be here today with Susie Roth from Hands of Hope. Susie, how are you doing today? Good, thanks for having me here. Well, if, if you don't see the live video, we're sitting in front of a fireplace in front of a very nice, uh, <laughs> very nice ministry center, so we'll have kind of a fireside chat. <laughs> That's today. great. Well, Susie, the big thing that I wanted to talk to you about today is just a, a, a simple issue, that, just a simple one. How can we solve foster care? <laughs> How can we solve the foster care crisis? And this, this is one of the issues I think every church leader, every Christian understands this is a problem. If kids are being removed from their families at just a massive rate in the state of Indiana, how can we help? But it's, it's difficult. You can talk about it and certainly want to pray about it, but then what do we do? And so that's the big thing I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, so would you jump in and tell us maybe three or five minutes about uh, kind of your background, how you became burdened about this issue, and then talk a little bit about Hands of Hope, your ministry. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and I love that because our kind of one of our mottos is everyone can do something. And so right. that kind of comes out of, though, I'm going to jump way, way back. Sure. Tell the story Please do. Uh, briefly, but when I was in junior high and I was reading the book of James, and there's a verse that talks about looking after orphans and widows in their distress is considered pure religion. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, I have no idea how to do that. I mean, it sounds like a great thing to do, but I have no idea what that would look like. Sure. So kind of fast forward, and when I was um, after college, married, had three biological kids, and talked to my husband about adopting our next child. And we ended up going, there's a whole story around that, as there is with every adoption story, but we went forward with adopting our youngest son, and it's been a tremendous blessing. But as we were pulling away from the orphanage in Russia, I looked out and saw all these kids standing there and thought, I have to help more children. And I felt like God really said to me, you can help more children by using your administrative gifts than, than bringing another child into your home. I mean, how many children can I bring into my home? Sure. But I can help more children if I helped other people kind of understand, going back to that verse, what does that look like? What can they practically do to be involved in this. So kind of that was the start of the idea of Hands of Hope. And in 2010, we became a 501c3. Our mission is to uniquely and deeply love children and vulnerable children at home and around the world. And kind of our huge passion, one of our huge passions is to help under, people understand what can they do. Practically, what does that look like to care for orphans and vulnerable children? And some people, think the only way to do that is by becoming foster parents or adopting. And there's so many more things that can be done. And so that's one of our huge passions as a ministry is to help people understand how they can get engaged in, as you kind of said at the very start, this extremely complex, really kind of dark area in sure. our community. So as of 2017, and you have these stats on your website, Indiana's rate of children in foster care was over twice the national average, uh, which just blows my mind, because I think yeah. of Indiana as a, a fairly wealthy state. Uh, I, I thought of a state that was doing fairly well as far as uh, just social demographics, those sorts of things. And, but then roughly half of foster parents quit after the first year of their first placement. So uh, less than a 3% chance for children who have aged out of foster care to earn a college degree at any point in their life. Now, for any uh, listener who actually a foster child has come out and you're excelling, that's awesome. You're a hero. But I remember a particular court hearing where a judge was talking about the psychological trauma that occurs the moment a child is yanked out. It doesn't matter how long. Yeah. Uh, it can be just for a day. But the trauma that ensues from being removed from a natural parent and how that affects all sorts of issues in their life, whether it's crime later on, the ability to graduate, yeah. um, unwanted pregnancies, those sorts of things. And so it just really blew my mind. Like, wow, this is such an issue. So this is something that you're you're focused on in your ministry. So why don't you jump in just a little bit, talk a little bit about the adoption side, if you, if you don't mind, just how churches could help with that as well a little bit. And then how do you practically help in the foster care crisis? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with the area of adoption and just kind of keep that brief and then talk about foster care. And in the area of adoption, there are multiple ways that a church can get engaged in helping the people in their church and in their congregation with adoption. And 
Hands of Hope actually has some resources to help churches with this as well. So one thing is just informational meaning. I always say the two things that keep people from adoption are fears and finances. So if there's people who for whatever reason are interested in more children or thinking about adoption, those are the two barriers that will keep people from adopting, fears and finances. So we have an informational meeting where we talk about specifically the fears and help people address that. And because I have adopted, I understand that personally very well. And then the financial side, Hands of Hope for anyone in the state of Indiana who qualifies has a matching grant program where they can get help with finances. And then we also have a list of resources that will help people address that. And churches can start their own adoption matching grant program if they want to. And Hands of Hope can be a resource for them in ter terms of how to address those things for adoptive families and then also how to provide support on the back end. So that's kind of briefly the adoption sure, side. Sure. And, you, and you're partnered with, uh, is it Christian Orphan Alliance? So Christian. we are a, a regional alliance for Christian Alliance for Orphans, which is a national organization. In the area of adoption, we also partner with a national organization called Lifeline for Orphans that provides matching grants. So we have a number of partnerships. In the area of foster care, we have some also some other partnerships from a national level that we'll get to, I think, at some point. Sure. But, yeah, we're a regional alliance for Christian Alliance for Orphans. Okay. Would you give just a brief overview? And some of the listeners may have heard uh, the, the episode of Doug Weinberg where we talked a little bit about the nuts and bolts of children being removed. But for listeners that didn't catch that episode and are unfamiliar with the system, would you give just a brief overview, kind of the nuts and bolts of how this works? You've got the Department of Child Services and the parents. So how does all that work together? Yeah, yeah. So Department of Child Services, those staff have just incredibly hard roles. I mean, they, I, I really believe it's the hardest roles, hardest jobs in the state of Indiana because they really have to make some difficult decisions, sometimes very quickly. They have thousands and thousands and thousands of calls every month that they have to go do an investigation on. And then sometimes someone, I mean different, there's a high turnover rate. So some people have a lot of experience, some people don't have as much experience, but they have to go in and they have to make a call on what is going on in this home situation. And we currently have 18,000 children in the foster care system here in the state of Indiana. From 2005 to 2017, there's an 89% increase in the number of kids. That's a huge increase in a short amount so of time. So one more time, 2005, 2000. To 2017, there was an 89% increase in the number of kids in care. Indiana has the fifth largest number of kids in care across the U.S., and we're not even close to the fifth largest state in terms mm -hmm. of population. So this is something that is currently being addressed, but the bottom line is it, built quickly and there was the staff, the child welfare staff, had a very hard time keeping up with it. This past legislative session, this is kind of pretty well known, but a lot of funds were given to Department of Child Services to kind of help with that. But just kind of taking it practically to a child, I mean you kind of talked about this before, but what's that like for a child who is in a home and then someone comes and they are just removed all of a sudden? with no warning and there's no question that in many cases it the child already has experienced trauma sure. for some reason or another due to what's happened but that in and of itself is a very traumatic event mm -hmm. you know they are taken with whatever belongings they have many times they come with almost nothing and then they're taken a lot of times to a DCS office where depending on the situation they may be there I mean, sometimes kids are even staying overnight in DCS offices while DCS tries to find homes sure. for the children. So it really is a very traumatic time for that child as they are trying to just kind of live in this new reality and everything they know has been kind of ripped away from them, if you will. Sure. So, and then they go to foster homes, obviously. And that is a whole range of experiences for foster parents. One of the big things Hands of Hope tries to do, we try to come alongside Department of Child Services staff and what they're doing and help them. We also try to come alongside foster parents because that's a super hard role. You talked about that 50% quit after the first placement mm -hmm. or the first year. We have taken a program from Georgia, um, Live the Promise in the state of Georgia, called Care Communities. And with a care community around a family, that number drops to less than 10% quit. So that is one of the issues I wanted to dive yeah. into. So backing up just a little bit. Yeah, sure. Kids can be removed for a variety of reasons. In Indiana, we have what's called a CHIN statute, mm -hmm. Child in Need of Services. That can be emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse. 
But a, and a large portion of those, uh, from what Doug is saying, mm -hmm. and I think we talked about this as well, a lot of them are just poverty-based. I mean, it's, they don't have food. Now, that poverty may have been caused by uh, recidivism as far as committing crimes, or a lot of times it's the drug crisis. Right. And so parents are spending money on drugs rather than on their kids. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not just poverty, but the kids are just yanked out for those, those reasons. And you mentioned the care community, and this really fascinated me, that, it, like you said, a lot of people think, oh, the only way I can help is if I adopt or if I'm a foster parent. Mm -hmm. But I thought this was an excellent way for anybody in a church, even those that may think, you know, I'm, I'm in the last season of my life, and so I'm certainly not gonna have a foster kid. Right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how can, how can they help? So would you explain that uh, community a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we love this idea of care communities in this program because it really allows for different gifts to be used. So, I mean, really the minimum you have to do to be a part of a care community is do one meal a month. So some people, that's what their role is in the care community as a family helper, is to deliver one meal a month to a foster family. But because there's four or five people all playing that same role, the foster family gets a meal once a week. So it's a high level of support and encouragement for the family. Um, just kind of a personal note, I just last night delivered a meal to a foster family. That's excellent though. That means you're not just talking about it. You're <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I just was able to give the foster mom a hug and say, how are you doing? And she was like, I'm tired, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, she had just, a particular incident had just occurred with the child that was in her care and it's hard it's a hard situation but with the care communities you can do that you can also there's team leaders who have those admin gifts some people have admin gifts they can be the person who kind of coordinates the team and makes sure it all happens and communicates with the foster family regarding what are the needs there's child mentors some people like to be with children and so they agree to once or twice a month be a mentor or depending on the age of the child just help provide child care in support of that foster family. So there's a whole team that comes around this foster family to help support them and what they're doing. And a big part of that is the prayer support and just the spiritual and emotional encouragement that the family gets by knowing they're not out there doing this alone over and over again. Before we started Care Communities, over and over again, I was hearing from foster parents just how isolated they felt and how they felt like, and this was even people like in my own church who I knew and they were talking about how isolated they felt. And I really got to the place where I felt like as an organization, I couldn't ethically keep asking people to be foster parents and talking to them about that if we weren't gonna do something to support them when they became a foster parent. And that started the journey of talking to other states to see what they were doing. We discovered sure. this model in the state of Georgia and then brought it here to the state of Indiana. I love this because think about the church in the New Testament, uh, that it, it truly was a community. And I think in our you know, hyper-connected but hardly connected world, we're all running a thousand miles an hour and we're lonely, yeah. like perhaps never before. Mm -hmm. uh, what an opportunity for the church to be the church. Absolutely. As a group of people loving on foster kids but doing it together. Yeah. And it's, it's not to just pat you on the back, hey, great job, you're a foster parent, hope it goes well for you. Right, being that family of God, Absolutely. Uh, what an amazing opportunity. And I think of uh, church leaders that are always, often being asked, what can I do, what can I do, yep. what can I do? Get plugged into the care, uh, this care community, make one meal a month. And yep. I'm just thinking of like, the senior citizens in a church, they want to help, but they're, they're not in the life stage where they're Absolutely. going to have somebody. They can make some mean casseroles. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And I, I watched the show, or the, the movie, Instant Family. Oh, yeah, recently. it's a great movie. And great movie. If, if you want to know what foster care is like, and I, I'm sure there are some inaccuracies and so on, but just the idea right. of this family taking in these kids and the, the cultural breakdowns that they have, um, and you think, well, I'm just making a meal. Right. But giving that mom the opportunity to rest just a little bit, not make, that, that is a big deal. It's a big deal to the family. Yeah. And really what Hands of Hope does is we, I love how you brought up the local church, mm -hmm. because our goal is to equip the local church to do the work. So we are not running the care community program per se. I mean, overall, we are kind of organizing the program, but our role, what we do is equip the local churches. They come, they get trained on how to do it, and they're running it in their congregation. 
for the people who are foster parents in their church. And then we have a couple churches who now have care communities around people in the community. Wow. And that has been super powerful to see how God has worked through some of those relationships and that support that's being provided. That's awesome. So kind of in my dream world, I would love to have a care community around every foster parent in the mm -hmm. state. And realistically, we should be able to do that. If you look at the number of churches and the number of foster families, it's absolutely doable if enough people yeah. get engaged. So you not only have, say there's a foster family in a particular church and the, the people in that church come around them, but they're also in a sense adopting, I mean, use the language of their, they're, yeah. not, they're not adopting a foster family that may not even be in their local Correct. congregation. Yeah, around. yeah. Wow. so we encourage the churches first to put, the, to put them around, a care community around the foster families in their church to make sure they are supported well. And then, if they have the capacity to reach out and have other foster families. And I can tell you, we've had foster families reach out to us and say, we want a care community. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> and so, awesome. we definitely could use more care communities around. Sure. So, let, let's jump into the care portal. And if, if you're listening to this podcast and you didn't catch the episode with Doug Weinberg, please go back and listen to that. It's going to really tee this up. Yeah. And Doug championed the concept of the care portal in the state of Indiana. He had done some of this work in uh, Nebraska and came back and had this great idea, met with, I think, 40 legislators. The governor recently signed this bill, and it's a great, I think, great opportunity for the church to work with government to solve this, this issue. So Hands of Hope is maybe not the official, but the kind of the formal ministry partner on the private slash faith-based side of this effort. So would you tell a little bit about how you heard about the CARE Portal and then kind of back to the nuts and bolts, how can churches get involved in this effort? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we're officially the implementing partner here in the state of Indiana. And the cool thing is, is to, that you got to hear from Doug and how kind of the things he was doing, because kind of parallel to that, at the exact same time, I was already, Hans Pope was already researching what other states were doing, had heard about Care Portal through Christian Alliance for Orphans, and then actually Bishop Blake, who did the very first pilot of Care Portal in the state of Texas, Texas uh -huh, he had come to Indiana, spoke at Every Child, talked to me about Care Portal, and got actually called one of the individuals, and we had a brief discussion on it. So kind of two parallel paths were happening. Doug was interested. He had come from the state of Nebraska, having implemented it. We in Hands of Hope were already working on kind of implementing it and bringing it to the state. And then through mutual friend, we were connected and okay. then joined efforts in bringing it to the state of Indiana. So that's kind of cool to see how God was working yeah. kind yeah. of in two parallel paths and then made the connection at just the right time to put it all together. Sure. So. You mentioned Every Child. Is that is that a conference at which church? Is yeah, it's at Eastern Star Church. It's held March. It'll be March fourteenth of two thousand and twenty. We hold it every year. It's to engage the faith community and helping make sure every child in Indiana is loved well. Mm -hmm. So last year we had about about four hundred twenty five attendees, representing over a hundred churches across Indiana, and we would love to see that keep growing. We really feel so strongly that we can do so much when we all work together and when the church becomes the big C church Absolutely. and not everyone kind of individually trying to figure it out. Hands of Hope feels like we can be that bridge organization making those connections for people and and really just kind of giving people the information about sure. what are the possibilities, what are those practical opportunities. And so coming to every child yeah. is a great way to learn about That's that. That's why I stopped. I won't yeah, thank you. That. I appreciate Listeners. that. <laughs> all right, so back to... Go. Yes, yes. Care for so, um, Care Portal, what Hands of Hope's role is in Care Portal is we are, we're called the implementing partner, and we basically, we have someone on staff with Hands of Hope, Jessica Gaffigan, and she's done an amazing job being the person who trains both Department of Child Services, she goes in and trains them on what to do with the Care Portal and how to do it, and then she also trains the churches. So basically, it's a software platform where Department of Child Service, who who's out there doing the investigations, seeing the most critical needs in our community. They're vetting those needs to say, which needs are the most, would be most impactful. And I'm gonna just right here really quick jump back to what you said about neglect. Indiana has 89% of the kids enter foster care due to neglect, which is a higher percentage than most states. Most states it's closer to like 60, maybe 60 to 70%. So 89% is kind of high, and some of that is obviously neglect where the child has to be removed. 
like severe neglect, that kind of situation. But there's also kind of a term I created myself, <laughs> poverty yeah. neglect. Yeah. But poverty neglect is effectively where it's due to poverty. Mm -hmm. And so Care Portal, what Care Portal is saying is, could we keep those kids in, in their families? Could we allow them to stay? And so what Department of Child Services is doing is they see a need like where the child doesn't have a bed. Maybe there's bed bugs in the house. Maybe there's some other situations. Maybe the mom, that we had a situation where mom needed a suit for an interview. Mm. So could they put those needs in? It's usually one time tangible needs. And that gets the DCS, put, the Department of Child Services puts it into the system that gets shot out to churches, participating churches, churches who say, yeah, we want to help with this. And those churches, then one of them jumps in and says, yep, I'll meet that need. Awesome. So, for example, that mom who needed a suit, the church said, and there were some other kind of smaller pieces to that. They said, yep, we can meet that need. They went and they actually delivered that to the family to help them. And we've had cases where the kids didn't have beds. I know one story where they went and delivered uh, three twin beds to the kids. Mm -hmm. And the kids were, like, so excited because they each got their own bed. And... But the other, even bigger piece to that is then they could stay in the home. Hmm. Because if the family just can't provide a bed for a child, then right. they can't stay in the home. So that's an even, that's even so much more than them having their own bed. But it's just a way that we can make an impact in some of these really critical areas in our state. And again, come alongside both the families, the children, and DCS. So coming back to what we talked about with the moment the kid is removed, mm -hmm. it's devastating to them. So where should we put our effort? Keeping them in the home. And I love this, that it's such a, just a practical way where DCS is, is working with churches. And I think right now it's an email. I think maybe they're working on an app as well. Correct. Um, yep. And we'll, we'll get into specifics about that in a second. Yeah. But that goes out and the church can respond. Yep. And then the church actually independently. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't show up with DCS on your arm. You show up as whatever church uh, and say, we're here to help meet this, this need. Correct. Yeah. Usually someone from DCS arrives with the, okay. with the individual from the church just to make that initial sure, connection. Sure. They may or may not stay. But yeah, we definitely have had both families and even DCS staff who are like, who are you? What are you? Why are you? Yeah. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? <laughs> like, which is really, but in a positive way, like really cool. So yeah, so, but the church does go and actually deliver and meet the need. And, and so you show up and you're with DCS, but they understand I'm from. So in mm -hmm. such and such church. church. Yeah. And, and so you can perhaps help in, in ways that, you know, maybe these, I'm, I'm just thinking about this practically because I have practice in this area. That the parents begin to see DCS as well, they're my supervisor. Mm -hmm. And anything I say is going to be used against me in a sense. It'll be put in a report. Sure. And so, yes, they're going to work with them. And again, I have so much respect for DCS workers mm -hmm. and the difficult things they have to do. But if we're trying to help these people solve them, why not have every hand on deck um, and try to help? And so maybe with the church, they can have that, they can build a relationship, uh, build some trust, and work in a way that, and perhaps these people work with the, the church in a way they would not be comfortable working with DCS. So I love that aspect. Absolutely. Of and there, there absolutely are situations where the church can give them resource information for additional resources, or in some states, and we've actually had it happen at this point in at least one case that I know of, where that member made a connection with the person and in a variety of different ways has continued to encourage the family. That's great, that's great. So as we kind of wrap up this part of the conversation, you are a faith-based organization. Correct. And you're working with government. Correct. And Never the twain shall meet, right? <laughs> uh, and, and so there are naturally going to be some tensions. And I, I broached this topic with Doug as well, that he would go into these meetings with legislators. First question, what about separation of church and state? Well, there, this is still an institutional separation, but why can't we partner together to solve these toughest problems? And I know that there's probably still some hesitancy from DCS workers because we haven't tried this before. How is this going to go? But I think it's a great opportunity for churches to get involved and say, hey, you know, we're, we're going to partner with you in this problem. We're not just going to sit on the side sidelines and throw spitwats at you. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're moving kids and have these, make these difficult choices. So would you talk a little bit about how you navigate that tension, even with your organization? Yeah, as absolutely. You're, uh, the sponsoring or implementing partner yeah. in Indiana. Yeah, absolutely. And I really think that what has 
benefited us a lot is that we have really taken the approach of how can we help. So instead of coming in with an agenda, we have approached Department of Child Services with how can we help you and what can we do to help. And I think that has gone a long way to building credibility for our organization with sure. them, that really we're not about kind of promoting our own agenda, but rather we are about coming alongside them. So one example is, you know, when I, I kind of started this conversation with DCS like quite a few years ago and said, how can we help? And they said, we need help watching, doing childcare for our support groups when we provide training for the foster parents. And so we have now, and in quite a few counties, come alongside and said, okay, we're gonna have background checked volunteers come and watch these kids for them and so that they can focus on the training. So, and then another thing was we had said, you know, what, this gets back to when a child first enters care, how can we help? And they had said, well, we don't really have a lot of storage space, but we could really use some toiletry items, like toothbrush, toothpaste, shampoo for when they first enter care. So that's where this idea that Hands of Hope now does called bridge bags came about, where when a child first is pulled, they can be given a bridge bag. So really, instead of, again, us coming up with our own ideas, we've tried to say, how can we help you? Mm -hmm. And I think that has helped a lot in just kind of relationally bridging the gap. Mm -hmm. And I've been pleasantly surprised at how open they have been to working with Hands of Hope, even knowing that we are a Christian organization. So you brought up a couple of just ideas that fascinate me. First was the communities, the care communities. Yeah. Then the bridge bag, which is basically the kid gets pulled out of their home, they don't have a toothbrush, they don't have some of the basic necessities, you're giving them that. But then you also mentioned a, a summer camp setting. Mm -hmm. I think is it Spring, spring Hill camp. camp? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, there is a kind of a separate group called Elijah's Cloak, they're not a 501c3, but it's a foster parent who her son, she adopted out of foster care. She had this passion, okay. and her and I, through a kind of another God event, connected, and we started to send kids to Spring Hill Camp, kids in foster care, at no cost. Wow. And that has been just a powerful way to support. Again, the kids, they all have, like some of them have said, it's the best week of my life. Mm -hmm. And then foster parents have said, you know, it's a, it's a great break for them, a week-long break, you know? They can go to vacation. <laughs> like all they kids can do... summer camp. Really. Exactly, yeah. So it's fun for them, it's fun for the kids. And this past year, um, through Elijah's Cloak, Tiffany Akers coordinates the program, 160 kids in foster care were able to go to Spring Hill Camp. And wow. Spring Hill Camp's been amazing to work with. Elijah's Cloak's really done a lot of coordination. Hands of Hope helps in terms of um, making the connections with the kids and families. And it's been a super cool way to provide support. And again, so every kid that shows up for that week is a foster kid, Correct. kid is foster care. Correct. That's amazing. Well, and it's not just one week. It used to okay. be that way. They used to all go to one particular week, but as it's grown, <laughs> that hasn't worked. So this past year actually was the very first year where they could pick any week to go okay. to Spring Hill Camp, which actually is even better for the families because they can pick the week that yeah. works best for them. So one of the last questions I had for you was, what's a, just a meaningful moment where you've seen God really just make, make a difference or change something? where you just felt like God was using your ministry? Yeah. Any meaningful moments? That... Yeah, I've actually had two really okay. recently. I, I couldn't choose between them, but I'll maybe just tell them both briefly, Please actually. Yeah. But one is with a foster parent who just at the DCS Wrapped Conference, I it's the foster parent I hadn't seen for a couple of years, but it's someone who's, their kids, I know their kids, I know the foster parents, they've been involved with Hands Hope, went to Spring Hill Camp, okay. did a number of things with Hands of Hope, and I saw him, and he just was like, we're so thankful for all that you did. And I said, how are the kids doing? And they've since been adopted. They're doing great. And I just, it's, those are the moments, I think, where I had another instance where someone came up to me and said, I want to introduce you to the two kids who we have in our home now because of Hands of Hope. Mm -hmm. and, and they were adopted at that point, too. And those are the times that just make me want to cry. Because, mm -hmm. like, I mean, what we, we believe the best place for any child is in a loving home. Like that's what we all want, whether it's back with your biological family and home supporting them, or whether it's an adoptive family. Like we want these kids to have safe, loving homes. So when I see that happen, that's a win. And that is so touching to my heart. Um, but then from a ministry perspective, I think another very recent thing that happened that just reminds me, I think, someone who has been involved with Hands of Hope says, said, she's a teenager, and she said, God loves them most. 
Mm. And I love that because this recent thing that happened reminded me how much God loves each one of these children. He is with these children. He loves these children. And we are just have the great privilege of joining in with what he already is doing and wants to do through us. So this was a case where someone contacted Hands of Hope on behalf of a friend who was actually dying of cancer. And they were looking for a home, um, someone who could take, um, yeah, just a really hard situation, right? And, you know, human nature, your immediate reaction might be, my immediate reaction, like, I don't even think we can help with this. You know, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. Like, what do you do with that kind of situation? But I, God put someone on my heart and who was in process of becoming a foster parent, called them. Turns out they were looking, they, they were interested in a child in the exact same age range of this mm -hmm. child. Made that connection and they got to meet. And I was privileged to be there when they, um, when the mom signed over guardianship for if something would happen um, to this family. And I think I thought, like, my part was so small, right? Mm -hmm. Our part as an organization was so small. And yet, God's moving. Like, that's, that's something only God can do. Only God can make those connections. In fact, the person who initially emailed us texted me and said, I feel like I see a miracle happening in front of my eyes. And I thought, you know, like, that's the blessing of getting involved. Like, we, it's such a blessing for us. We get to see God moving. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. The stories are crazy hard of these kids' stories. But we get the great privilege of seeing how much God loves these kids and how God is for these kids and how much value he places on these kids and we get to play a small part in being a part of that. Amen. That's powerful. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. So mom who's dying of cancer is able to, to sign off it. For me, when I see God do something through me or yeah. through my ministry, those are the days that I'm just, wow, that it's all right. worth it. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you had a billboard on which you could put a message uh, mm -hmm. for the Big C Gospel Preaching Church, yep. what would that be? Yeah, one thing I, anyone who's been around me has heard me say over and over again is there are powerful possibilities when we all work together. Like, I really believe God wants to use the Big C Church mm -hmm. to make a difference in this area that I believe is the darkest area in our community. And I'm... As the more I've gotten involved in it, I, I'm so surprised that the church for such a long time, it feels like, has kind of stepped away from it. I think that's not historically been true, but definitely kind of more in the shorter term. And so I'm super excited to see how God is stirring in the state of Indiana and really raising up churches and individuals and bringing us all together in unity. Because I really do believe there's powerful possibilities when we all work together. And just one more quick thing about that. I, there's that verse, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Mm -hmm. And I really thought a lot about that. Like it says a city cannot be hidden. It doesn't say a light can't be hidden. And I think what God's doing in the state of Indiana and hands up this privilege to be a part is creating a city of lights. And that can't be hidden. And that's going to make a difference and impact the darkness. Yeah. Well, it's right in line with the Good Citizen podcast. Uh, we, we feel like the church has withdrawn, and there are lots of complicated reasons because sure. of that. Maybe we feel like, well, the government took over that. But this is an awesome opportunity for the church to get engaged. So as we wrap up today, I want to send listeners to kind of that first step. How can they practically get involved? Uh, first of all, Care Portal. But then also, I believe Hands of Hope can help come in and do a training for your church Correct. Uh, to get people engaged in this. So would you give us that information as we finish up? Yeah, absolutely. So... The best way to get it is to go to our website, handsofhopein.org, because there's a serve menu option, and under that you can go to local opportunities and see lots of local opportunities to just get step, to step in. There's also care communities, and if you go to that care communities link, it'll show you the next clinic date. Okay. The next one is, I think, in September in Northeast Indiana, and there's one coming in November to Central Indiana. So you can sign up to attend our clinic where we train the churches on doing a family advocacy ministry and then also the care community program. And there's also a link there for Care Portal. Awesome. So for all of that is right under the serve menu on our website. All right, well, certainly encourage listeners to go there. And if you're outside the state of Indiana, uh, you can go to the Care Portal website and also look mm -hmm. for similar ministries. And I think if you contact Hand of Hope, I know that you have relationships kind of around the country. And so perhaps we can direct you to a similar ministry in your state. So Susie, thank you so much for what you're doing. 
Uh, we just pray that God will continue to bless your ministry and as you're helping foster kids in the state of Indiana. So thank you for being on. Thank you so much for allowing me to.